Sejin introduces the three gray rabbits named Pyrrhic, Pimic, and Pibic who are going to stay with them. Now they greet everyone and say that they should get along well. The parent rabbits and their first-generation kids also welcome them. Sejin says that now that they have some highly skilled craftsmen on their side, their farming will also increase by one whole level. The gray rabbits are happy to hear that and tell Sejin that they will prepare everything they can. Sejin already has something on his mind, and he asks the gray rabbits if they can create houses for the white farming rabbits first. The new batch of baby rabbits has finally become adults, so they need some houses. On top of that, they need some houses for the gray rabbits as well. Well, the second-gen rabbits are not going to do well on their own. To put it politely, Sejin knows that they need to be independent, but he can't count on them to build their own house. One of them has dug a pit, and a second rabbit is sleeping there because he is satisfied with that. Nearby, another rabbit is hiding under a pile of leaves. The architect Gray Rabbit tells Sejin that it is his specialty to create homes for rabbits, so he can leave everything to him. Theo climbs on Sejin's shoulder, telling him that he also needs a mobile home, but Sejin tells him that he has his bundle. Well, the Gray Rabbits get alert upon hearing that and say that they can make a cat tower. After that, the rabbits notice Sejin's green onion bedding and ask him if he also does not have a home. He replies that he just sleeps on green leaves because that is enough for him. The rabbit suggests that they should make a home for him too. Sejin is surprised to hear that and asks the rabbit if he can create a home for him here. The rabbit says that it will be difficult to create a house fit for him inside the cave, but it will not be difficult outside the cave. On top of that, there are a lot of trees there so they don't have to worry about the raw materials. Sejin is happy to hear this and says that he would love to have a home. He says that lately, he has been staying out of the cave quite a lot to look after his outdoor fields. On top of that, since he has a lot of allies there, including the mama bear, the minotaurs, and the silver wolves, he thinks that since they are all strong, his security is almost guaranteed. Sejin decides to leave the construction of the house to the architect rabbit and asks him if there is anything he needs. The rabbit says that they would prefer it if they could make some bricks for stronger houses. For that, they need some mud or fine sand, and they ask Sejin if they can find anything like that on the 99th floor. Well, thinking about mud, Sejin recalls the exact place where they can find it. He takes the gray rabbits straight to the Minotaur's territory and asks them what they think about the mud here. The rabbits find that the mud has just the perfect amount of moisture, and there are also some dried leaves mixed in it. He claims that it will be the perfect material to make some bricks. Sejin is glad to hear that, but the Minotaur King is not. He asks Sejin why he needs the mud because this is food for the minotaurs. Well, Sejin tells him that they need to make a new deal. He says that the architect rabbit, Pimic, is going to teach them how to make bricks. He says that if they allow them to make bricks using it and supply the mud, they will get green onion leaves. The gluttonous minotaur king doesn't let Sejin complete his sentence and specify the details. He excitedly takes the offer right away. He tells all his minotaurs to stop eating the mud because then they won't have enough to make bricks. The minotaurs are confused, but they obey their king. Sejin is satisfied and thinks that they will be busy for a while now. Well, he is indeed going to be very busy, as are his friends. Hing uproots a tree to show off his strength to the little rabbits, and they are impressed. However, right behind him is his mother, who has easily plucked two big trees. The black minotaurs are also working as tractors to plow Sejin's field, and the increased workforce of white farming rabbits further cultivates the plow land and grows green onions on it. They use their rakes and shovels to create furrows in the ground, while other rabbits use their respective watering cans to water the vast fields of crops growing outside. In between, the bear cub Kung and the wolf chieftain Elka spar to become stronger, and Sejin just cheers them from the sidelines. He pats Kung for his good performance and rewards him with his favorite snack, a bottle of honey. Even Elka starts drooling when he sees the bear cub drinking honey, and Sejin gives him a bottle too. While Elka is initially nervous, he accepts his generous gesture. Sejin then takes help harvesting crops from the Chunky Cart Rabbit and the Chunky Rabbit of the second generation, whom we will now call Chunky Number 2. Sejin uproots a bunch of the newest and highest quality crop on his farm which is the sweet pumpkin sun potato. Because the plots were blessed by his passive buffs, 
He harvests 15 sun potatoes in one go and gets a good deal of job experience thanks to the various bonuses and experience gains. Sejin levels up and gets a bonus stat. He is happy to get a lot of sweet potato sun pumpkins, but then complains that it is too hot. Sejin uses his skill to create a cloud over his head to give him some shade from the sun. As he uses the skill, his proficiency in using it increases. He then looks at the huge pile of green onion leaves in front of him and says that while the rabbits are creating houses, he should also ask them to create a sturdy warehouse outside. Suddenly, Theo approaches him because he is planning to go down the tower. He tells Sejin that he has packed a lot of cherry tomatoes from the cave just now. Sejin asks him if he still has some space in his merchant bundle. He wants to try selling the detoxifying green onions to the hunters too because there might be some hunters who need them. Theo says that he will take 100 of the green onions for now, and Sejin tells him to do his best and says that he should have a little snack before leaving. Well, as Theo approaches the pile of green onion leaves, he wonders if it will even sell well. But since Sejin has never been wrong about business, he decides to trust him. Despite that, Theo isn't fond of the green onions because they are a bit too pungent for his taste. As he is taking his sweet time, Sejin tells him to come back as quickly as possible. Theo is distracted as he replies to him, and as he turns around to face Sejin while putting the green onions in his bag, he puts a bunch of sweet potato sun pumpkins in it as well. Unaware of his innocent mistake, Theo runs towards Sejin, and the Minotaurs also come there for snack time. Meanwhile, something eventful is happening on the 67th floor of the tower, which is a dense forest with reptilian life forms. A green frog sits on a tree branch croaking without a worry, but then an arrow comes and pierces its head. The one who shot the arrow was a lizardman archer who planned to have a feast out of the dead frog. He climbs down to the dead frog, which is much larger than you can expect. However, before he can start eating, a red bug monster comes there and starts eating the frog. It is the same monster that destroyed the 55th floor of the tower. Well, the lizard man doesn't care, and he eats the monster as a source of protein. Suddenly, a huge horde of bug monsters were present nearby. They give death stares to the sole lizard man, and then suddenly attack him. A poor lizard man can't do anything as they swarm him. As the bug swarm is done with him, there is no trace left of the lizard man except for his bow and quiver in a crater on the ground caused by the attack of the bugs. The bug monsters fly deeper into the 67th floor that's signaling a great disaster. Meanwhile, Eileen suddenly gets some notifications while she is sleeping peacefully in her home. The notifications keep ringing, and she is forced to wake up with irritation. She complains that she was finally able to get some good sleep, but now the system alert is blaring so loudly. She decides to check the messages through the magic crystal ball, and they erupt all at once. Aline has more than 1,000 unread messages that freak her out. The message says that there are about 5.3 billion red locusts who have infiltrated the 67th floor of the tower. Aileen freaks out even more on learning that the red locusts are back because they are monsters that invade the tower from the outside. It has been 100 years since the locusts last invaded the tower. At that time, Eileen's grandfather was in charge, and he somehow resolved the issue. Thanks to that, he was able to barely stop the destruction of the 55th floor back then. Aileen uses her managerial authority to connect to the external communication channels, but the system tells her that it is unable to do so. Aileen is frustrated now that she can't contact her grandfather for help. Suddenly, a system window pops up in front of her telling her that 0.1% of the 67th floor has been devastated by the red locusts. Within a couple of seconds, she gets another message telling her that the number has increased to 0.02%. Now Aileen is utterly perplexed and wonders what she should do.